Welcome, everybody. We'll get started. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm David Rubin, Amherst class of 78. Um, and as a former Zumbai, it's very strange to be on this stage without holding a pitch pipe and doing some silly choreography. Um, I promise you, neither of those things will occur th <laughs> this morning. Um, we are here to talk about the current inflection point in motion pictures, both as a, a form of entertainment and, and cultural expression, and also um, as an industry. Um, but first, I would like to introduce my distinguished panelists. Uh, Gordon Radley, class of 68, uh, joined George Lucas's remarkable company, Lucasfilm, in 1985. And after holding several leadership positions there, was president of Lucasfilm until his retirement in 2003. Well, I mean, we could be here for hours talking about the contributions of that uh, significant company and the successful films that it, it generated. Uh, but, but part of Gordon's and, and Lucasfilm's legacy are the technological advances uh, brought to filmmaking by Lucasfilm's subsidiaries, uh, THX, uh, Industrial Light and Magic, Skywalker Sound. These are all essential parts of the, the blockbuster films that we have gone to movie theaters to see. Um, Vic Levin, the class of 83, is a Golden Globe winning writer, director, and producer. He came up in television first as a writer and then producer on shows like The Larry Sanders Show and Dream On, perhaps most famously on 116 episodes of Mad About You as writer and, and co-executive, uh, I'm sorry, as uh, executive producer and showrunner, and then as a writer and co-executive producer on Mad Men, and more recently on Survivor's Remorse and Heels, and the forthcoming Extended Family on NBC, and Vic now continues to write and direct film and television. Jackson Spilka, class of 2018, graduated with a degree in math and psychology, and shortly thereafter began working as the manager of strategy and business development for Annapurna Pictures, which is a company known for the films Zero Dark Thirty, American Hustle, Vice, Phantom Thread, If Bill Street Could Talk, and television limited series, recent ones, like The Staircase and Pam and Tommy. And he just completed his first year at the MIT Sloan School of Business. Um, by way of introducing myself, uh, after graduation, I spent two years on the production staff of Saturday Night Live uh, before working on the casting of films in New York like Ragtime, Silkwood, and Amadeus. Um, then in LA, as a casting director, uh, what someone recently told me was on over 90 films, um, uh, including The Addams Family, uh, I have to read this list myself, um, um, Fried Green Tomatoes, The Firm, Four Weddings and a Funeral, The English Patient, uh, Men in Black, uh, The Talented Mr. Ripley, and the movie that everybody wants to talk to me about, Mel Brooks's Spaceballs. <laughs> <laughs> Everything else goes by the wayside. Uh, and recently, uh, limited series uh, like Big Little Lies, uh, Little Fires Everywhere, and Nine Perfect Strangers. And I, I recently completed three terms as president of the Motion Picture Academy, which was an incredible honor and a string of headaches um, uh, as we coped with the pandemic and, and, and mostly the remarkable changes in, in the movie world. Uh, and then, of course, it was uh, about producing an Oscars broadcast every year. Um, and I'll just say that if any of these panelists slaps another panelist, <laughs> I am out of here. <laughs> um, I would, I would first like to uh, take advantage of Gordon's historical perspective on, on the ways movies have been buffeted by and threatened by, if you will, changes in technology and, and, the, and the ways that we've received our entertainment. I mean, it probably goes back to when silent films became talkies, but, it, but Gordon, could you give us a, a sense, of, a big picture sense of where we've been and we can then move on to where we are and where we might be going? Is this detach? No. Um, we're June 2023. So as David mentioned, it's an inflection point, as we say, in the industry and probably in our culture in terms of how uh, we're going to be experiencing cultural entertainment. 
But I first want to quickly ask, as I look at the audience, um, how many are under 50, if I can be so bold, in the audience? Okay, those that are under 50, how many films did you see in the, did you see three or less, three or more films last year in theaters? How many did? Okay, uh, let me ask the, of the, those over 50, did you see three or more films in a theater last year? Whoa, five or more. How many saw five or more films in a theater last year? 10 or more films in a theater. Very interesting, very interesting. So, you know, the, the lo not the logic, the, the, the observation that people keep wanting to make, and it's true, is that film theaters are dying. People aren't going to them, especially post-COVID. And um, that drives a lot of consequences. And there's kind of three, in my mind, three consequences. One is an aesthetic consequence, one is a film business consequence, and one is an audience consequence. And the other thing I would say is this setting is kind of awkward because we're sitting up here and you're out there and we're all in this together. The, how this all turns out from here on in the future is gonna be determined by everyone, everyone in the country and where they choose to go to see entertainment. And that will drive, as I say, consequences aesthetically in terms of the business and in terms of the audience and how they experience things. A bunch of years ago, probably 25 years ago, I was at an Amherst reunion and I heard a panel and there was an historian on technology. And he said something that stayed with me forever. He said, technology is neither good nor bad nor neutral. So as, you, as we talk today, just think about that and, and continue to remember how he set that out because it's, for my whole career, I kept coming back to that statement he made in a panel at Stern uh, over there, uh, Stern Auditorium. So uh, the Academy Award, which this gentleman did a brilliant job of overseeing the Academy. I gave him a lot of shit, I mean, on various issues, truly. I happily took it. <laughs> truly, it's a very tough job, and he did a masterful job at it. But the qualification to be a best picture is that you must show a film in a theater for at least one week. So what that is saying in a lot of ways is Cinema is experienced in a theater. What's in a theater? It's a large room filled with hopefully a lot of people, with a large screen, in an undistracted environment, with a sound system that is hopefully advanced, if not enhanced by the modern technologies. And the filmmaker is creating his art form for that venue. That's cinema, that's been cinema since the creation. Now let me just quickly, 50 years ago when I entered the business, 1973, now given the skew of the audience, this may not be so uh, challenging, but there was celluloid. That's what movies were. They were projected, they were captured on film cameras with celluloid. They were edited linearly which meant if you wanted to add a scene or see how it worked, you had to find it on a strip, you cut it, you spliced it in, you looked at it, didn't work, you went and you repeated that process. It was a linear experience. Theaters were mono, maybe a little bit of the introduction of stereo. It was uh, an analog world. So what happens? I'll, I'll fast forward a lot of this. In 73, I'm sorry, 77, Star Wars came out. And I'm gonna ask how many of you saw Star Wars in a theater when it opened in 77? When it opened in 77? Okay, you remember after the crawl disappears, Starfighter goes by, Imperial Cruiser rumbles overhead seems to go on forever. And you don't know how long that 
big thing is going to continue and the, the theater is rumbling. Lucas obviously created that experience to trigger immediately, this is different, you've never seen anything like this before. That would only have been experienced in the theater. The sound that he was creating needed to be reproduced in that theater. Now one of the things, I'll quickly aside, he made sure Dolby had just come along. Star Wars could only be released in a theater that had Dolby sound. So it was a way to push Dolby introduction into theaters. What else happens? Early, mid-80s, along comes the advent of digital technologies. First comes into post-production areas. So what I was saying that celluloid was being used and to cut, edit things, you had to cut pieces of celluloid. All of a sudden, computers are being used and you can do things non-linearly. Same thing with sound, where you could access sound and put it into your soundtrack and test it out in a digital fashion. Um, and then around uh, early 90s, digital enters the world of film production. Most dramatically, when we, we created animated creatures in a film interacting with live actors in a believable way. And Jurassic Park was that breakthrough movie. If you remember the kitchen scene with the velociraptors chasing after the actors, that was it. That was the, the moment of, um, remind me, what's the, um, what's the sound film that everyone talks about is creating sound with Al Jolson? I'm jazz, singer. jazz singer. Jazz singer, thank you. That was the jazz singer of the digital age. Everything after that was faster, better, cheaper. But once that was shown to occur, now you're using digital to create film. Not to, and you're using digital for backgrounds, you don't have to create sets, you can use this. So the digital technologies are changing the way films are made. So what was the last part of that? Digital cameras are being used to capture film. So you've got digital in the capture, you've got digital in the production and post-production. What was left was digital in the exhibition. So we had to go out and put digital, cam digital projectors into theaters. So with episode one, came out in 90, thank you. <laughs> um, we made sure if you wanted to show that film, you had to have a digital camera, a digital projector. So what I'm describing is a evolution of the technology and how it affected the experience of film. But film still is in a big auditorium. It's in a, f a venue like this. And that's the way the filmmakers were intending it to be. We had a company, part of our group, THX was created. Well, let me explain. When a filmmaker is in the, the mix, the final mix, he's got sound, effects, and, and dialogue. And he's putting those three, you know, sound, music, I should say, music, sound effects, and dialogue. So he's putting those three major streams together, combining them, mixing them in certain ways. He's sitting in a room and making creative decisions based on what he's hearing. Well, it's irrelevant if it then gets put out into the universe and no one is in a theater that can hear what he's just created in the way he just created it. It'd be like an artist uh, painting a wonderful painting, putting it in an exhibit, and you put a gauze drape over it. You're not seeing what the filmmaker created. In this case, you're not hearing what the filmmaker created. So THX was a way to, re, uh, to have theaters have a sound system that reproduced exactly what the filmmaker is hearing when he's making that creative decision about how he wants his film to sound. So again, there is this integral connection between what the filmmaker is intending and where that art form is going to be exhibited. Um, we're one final thing, I guess I should say. In around the mid-90s, the length of a cut, everyone knows what a cut is you know, in the film. Well, when you're watching a film, and uh, excuse me, I've got a nose drizzle here, but when you're watching a film and there's 
two people talking, you'll look at some way and then all of a sudden it's a reverse and you're looking at it a different way. Usually you're not even conscious of it. But in the mid 90s, the length of a cut got cut in half. Why? Because the people who were going to theaters, kids, were watching interactive entertainment, computer games, fast, fast, fast. So all of a sudden, film cuts became fast, fast, fast. So the art form was changing as a reflection of the technology that was being introduced. So now we have streaming. And streaming creates a wonderful, well, let me go back to good, bad, and not neutral technology. Streaming is, I would argue, not the art form of cinema if it's going to be seen on a laptop or horrors to be on a handheld. I think, that, is that obvious to everyone? If, if film is a cinema art form is supposed to be in a theater room with the sound system, with the screen, with all the aspects of what cinema is and what the filmmaker is creating it for, if all of a sudden it's being watched on a laptop, it's no longer what the filmmaker intended. Now, in a lot of cases, filmmakers say, I want my film to be seen, I don't care how it's seen. And that's legitimate. Just get it out. But one can argue, just like you have to be shown for a week in a theater in order to qualify to be best picture, it isn't cinema as we know it, as we have known it. So where that goes from here, Jackson's generation will, will determine. I mean, uh, dinosaurs like myself, it's, we're irrelevant. It's really, just like in the mid-90s, the length of a cut changed, I can clearly see as filmmakers are now making entertainment for streaming with the idea and intention it will be seen on a laptop, they're going to think much differently about how visuals, what visuals are, how fast they cut, what the sounds are going to be like. I have no idea. I can't even imagine it. And that's for that generation to imagine it and to create it. But cinema as we've known it will inevitably change. And again, how long theaters last, we can argue that for at great length. People will always say the Friday night movie will drag in the teenagers and they're going to want to see Marvel movies and event movies, you know, that will be what cinemas are for. And everything else will be streamed maybe seen in your home, but seen in a laptop. So that, I'm going to stop now, but that's kind of a 20,000 foot view of how we got to where we are at this day. Incredibly helpful. Um, and uh, the one mitigating factor that I'll point to is the technological improvement, not on laptops per se, or phones, but in home television viewing um, and you know audio systems in people's houses. Now that's obviously has a socioeconomic factor because those, those, that new equipment isn't bargain basement. But uh, it's conceivable, I guess you could say, that when you're sitting in a, on a comfortable couch uh, in, in reasonable proximity to a large screen television with a good audio system that you could replicate to some degree the experience, but certainly not officially sanctioned uh, audio and video projection and sound that would rival the state of the art uh, theatrical exhibition, but it's a factor. Um, the, the statistics about streaming, uh, there's a recent Forbes magazine article that said the number of subscriptions to online video streaming services worldwide has reached over 1.1 billion. 78% of all U.S. households subscribe to at least one or more streaming services. And the average American spends more than 13 hours a day using some type of digital media. And that, uh, and that includes their phones, I'm sure. Um, my question to you, Vic Levin, is um, with, with the convenience of streaming, uh, will watching movies in theaters ever rebound? Well, uh, first of all, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see you. Uh, it's very, very early in the morning for a writer, but I'll do my best. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, I, I don't. I don't know. I, I don't know if it'll ever go back to what it was, and and I don't have time to, you know, plan my writing future based on whether it will or it won't. Uh, I have to deal with what is, and what is is, in my case, I write 
small movies and small television. Uh, vastly more people see my films on some version of a TV or a laptop than see them in the theater. So I happen to like uh, long shots of people walking toward the camera from far away. If you're in a theater and uh, the screen is this big, even at the beginning of the shot, there they are. You can see them, right? They're walking toward the camera for a couple of blocks in a great city like New York, and it's great, and you can see them, and they're getting closer, and oh, now they're, now they're big. Now they're, they're, you know, big and tall, and now you can see faces, and it's great. And, and then I watch my kids watch movies. <laughs> on this, and at the beginning of my shot, the people are a little, <laughs> little speck of dust right there, just little, and it's, and it's a long time before they're even recognizably human. And, uh, and my kids have switched to a TikTok video <laughs> of someone making an ice cream on a 3D printer. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I, I, have to, I have to adjust to, to what, what is going on right now, and that means that I, I have to change the way I shoot these things and write these things, and if I don't, it, it'll be the ice cream. And, you know, I'll have to tell them later what my movie was about and ask them that since they're my blood relatives and I, I've, I've supported them all these years, perhaps they could just <laughs> sit through it if they don't mind. <laughs> um, so, but, but the answer, my answer to your question is I don't know. I, I, hope that, I hope that, as Thomas Pinchon said, you know, all correction eventually swings back towards some reasonable middle ground and people go to theaters again to see other than, something other than superhero films and all respect, big, giant, tentpole movies that are wonderful but are only a certain portion of the delivery system that, in my view at least, can still provide literature and original thought. That's, you know, a view I hope we all share, that sometimes movies can be as good as novels or as good as plays. Um, but I, uh, again, I, I just can't say. I don't have a crystal ball. I have a few years left before I lose my wits. And so, <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm just gonna get up every day and write something that I can, that I can put in a theater, but that also will play on this thing in a way that doesn't lose the, the, the youngest two-thirds of, of the potential audience. Uh, the rest is just hope. You know, the rest is, is this crazy hope that you will do something right that people will talk to one another about and figure out a, a way to watch. And the last thing I'll, I'll say is that if you write comedy, as I mostly do, at least there's an element of comedy, attempted comedy, in, in, in most of the stuff that I write, Having you know, a room full of people together taking it in makes a difference in how it is received and thought of afterwards. I don't know why, I'm, I'm not a, a psychologist, but there's something about having a group of people together in a room that makes things funnier and makes things more joyous and more uh, you know, contagiously delicious. If you're sitting alone in your living room or with you know, the, the, the family that you may or may not be getting along with, watching some <laughs> comedy that's subtle or uh, you know, at least requires active listening, uh, you, you might not laugh. And you might have a completely different impression of that film than you would have had if you'd been sitting in a big room with 500 other people having an experience that you can discuss later in the taxi with your uh, phone being turned on for the first time as opposed to being on the whole time and held in your hand uh, and with the other 498 reactions in your head, not just yours. Uh, and I, I think that's part of the reason I picked this business because it was collective, because it was communal. Uh, because these were experiences that we could remember as experiences and not just uh, as, 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 you know, a story that we were told. The experience of waiting online to see a, a film the night it 
open, the experience of walking in and grabbing your seat and, 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 and having the lights go down and thinking, I think, I think this might be good, you know. Uh, all of that is gone when you're in your living room. So I hope that it comes back, but I don't know. Thanks, thanks. I mean, I, I always come back to what I think is a sort of a primal need for a mankind to sit together in the dark. I think it goes back to cave dwellers where there are cave drawings and they, they assemble around a fire and somebody's telling a story that's related to the drawings on that wall. And um, uh, I, I, I don't know if it's genuinely primal, but, uh, but I do think it is, it is sort of a, a, an essential part of uh, the community that we all have. Um, but with that, I turn to our 20-something. <laughs> um, and, and not to pry into your social life, but, I, but I'm, I'm curious to know how your contemporaries are interacting with the various uh, modes of receiving entertainment. And, you know, is there a Saturday night at the movies, or does, is that just dead and gone? Right, well... Thank you very much, David, for putting this together. And I have seen the 3D ice cream. It's a great video. Um, it's truly. Um, I think, just as like a quick anecdote to sort of paint how I, not I personally consume entertainment, but just a situation I found myself in. It was two weeks ago. It was 11.30 PM or so, and I was just scrolling through TikTok. Quickly, if you're not familiar with TikTok or you just like know it in the news because it's getting banned in every state, uh, it's basically just short form video content on your phone. It could be seven seconds long, 30 seconds long, up to five minutes. And it's sort of the newest way to, you know, have a Tic Tac and just kind of just like scroll through and see, you know, all of these creators and influencers making these videos. And so I was on TikTok just lying in bed and I all of a sudden saw like the first two minutes of the movie I Love You Man uploaded, love the movie, so naturally I watched, and I saw it said part one. So naturally I clicked on, you know, what was part two, and all of a sudden, an hour and a half later, I realized I had scrolled through 19 different TikTok videos to watch one movie that I've seen 45 times before. <laughs> And I woke, and I didn't really think of it at that point, it was 12.30 and I was fast asleep. But then I woke up the next day and thought it was so interesting that I had no intention of really doing this, but it just was so effortless and easy. And like Gordon and Vic were saying, not the way that the director was intending for us to see it at all, but just, you know, sort of paints a picture of how easy it is to sort of have access to these, you know, to this content at this point. Um, I think like, you know, to put it, you know, speak bluntly, the Saturday night at the movie, I do believe is dead. I don't believe it's a social thing anymore. I don't, unless it's the Marvel, you know, the Marvel movies or the Star Wars movies, there's no real like spoiler culture or like real need to go and sort of see something the weekend it comes out. I think just from a value proposition at this point, you have the, you know, the price of Netflix for one month is the price of, you know, three quarters of a movie ticket plus popcorn plus parking. And so I think just as you have like a, you know, a cost conscious generation, it's just a harder sell in general. You know, change that by the fact where it's like really the motivation to be seeing these movies and TV shows when they come out, or movies more so in theaters, is that you can sort of just join the like, the Twitters and the Reddits and the threads and sort of, you know, enjoy these conversations that are going on with like-minded, you know, and maybe different-minded individuals. But I do believe that there, you know, really isn't this, you know, guiding force that's pushing Gen Z. I don't really consider myself Gen Z. I consider myself the youngest millennial. I just like want to be <laughs> want to be clear about that. Um, but that's, that's, a, that's a good title for something: the youngest millennial. <laughs> we'll, we'll write it after. We'll write it after. Um, and I think part of this is sort of the fact that because of the access that we have to these, we call them like TikTokers or creators or influencers, there really is no longer for, we'll call it like 16 year olds to 22 year olds, and I'm curious how you feel with having your kids. I don't really feel that those age people have like the bankable movie star that we all had growing up. I don't think that there's, you know, a single actor that is going to get the bulk of 16 or 17 year olds immediately to a movie theater. 
I think them seeing the reaction that Top Gun had last summer was the first exposure that they had to the power of a movie star. And I think that we no longer have, because of the, you know, social media making all of the lives of these movie stars so prevalent, there's no, you know, there is no secret lifestyle anymore. It's all out there for everyone to see. And so we have this, like, omnipresent, you know, in front of us, constant creators. And so why are this Gen Z going to be so excited and like build up this, you know, excitement to see like an actor who they haven't really seen anything from in two years when their favorite TikToker is posting four videos a day. And so I think that there's sort of that, you know, just the value proposition has just completely, you know, shifted scales. And while I do believe there's always going to be a place for movie theaters and that Marvel, you know, you're going to have Marvel and IP backed things have the baked in audience. I think the real drive to get younger people to the movie theaters is going to be harder and harder. Is there an, a, an, an attention span of your contemporaries that even allows them to watch things on streaming? Uh, a movie on streaming or even an episode and, and right. the notion because I see it all, all the times with the younger people that I do know where they're watching one screen and they're also watching their phone at the same time. Um, exactly. So, you know, the notion, you know, my idea of a good night of entertainment is an Ingmar Bergman film with, you know, just two Swedish people talking to each other on the, <laughs> on the screen and you have to pay attention because it's all nuance. Um, uh, and, you know, the notion of dividing your attention between your, your phone screen and, and your television screen is already mind-blowing to me. I mean, did, can people handle it? Right. I, I think that's a really good point. And I did clock when Gordon mentioned that even, you know, 25 years ago, they realized that they had to, you know, shorten the length of cuts because people were having intention spans and there needed to be this interactive content. And I'm like, when you were talking about the wide shot, like that's a, the long shot, that's exactly the point where it's like, when you're in a movie theater in the proper environment watching those long shots, you're like there to buy into every second of the film and the director and the writer's vision. If I'm watching that on my laptop and I see a long shot that like in my mind, I'm like, okay, this is gonna be like 30 seconds long. You just take out your phone and do like a quick Twitter <laughs> scroll, you know? And so that is like a, a really important notion of how you need, of how you need to be so deeply bought in to like what exactly you're enjoying or else it's just, you know, not how anyone really expected you to be able to consume the content. Amazing yeah. and mind blowing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I do want to leave time for, for questions from the audience, but I, I do want to mention um, that, uh, that Vic has been very involved in the Writers Guild strike. He's a, an esteemed writer, and you can see from his wardrobe selection. <laughs> and uh, and uh, not only does he have, obviously, all of our support, but you know, the support of, of so many in, in the industry, uh, not y you personally and the Guild itself, but, but one of the issues that is being addressed by this strike is another piece of technology that will have an effect on filmmaking, and I think it's worth just mentioning the, the effect of AI and the concern about AI. Uh, even in, in the time that I've spent with my own class at Reunion, the subject of AI has come up a, a number of times because it's something that people are discovering and concerned about in their personal lives, but professionally and creatively, it has a huge impact, I'm assuming. You know, AI is better at this moment than it was when we all sat down. <laughs> and it'll be better again in five minutes and better again five minutes after that. And, you know, our struggle as a guild, which is also the Director's Guild's struggle, I'm a member of that guild as well, and SAG, I'm also in SAG, it has an even more acute problem because at this instant you can reproduce any human being and have them act as though they were in something that they were never in as a corporeal person. Uh, so we are looking at a world in which machines have or soon will be able to replace us with an anodyne version of ourselves, whatever it is we do. They're large language models, they look at what's on the internet, they smash it into molecules and they reassemble the molecules with what they guess are the correct next choices. Sometimes they get it wrong, but they'll get better. Sometimes they uh, are incredibly good and, and will still get better. 
Are they funny? I don't know. Are they dramatic? I don't know. I've heard stories of sonnets written by computers that made grown adults cry. I've heard uh, disastrous stories too, but I know that they are basically a labor cost reducer. They are a labor cost reducer. And in, in our line of work, if we don't have enough people working, our pension and health plans will collapse. When? Uh, not tomorrow, not 10 years from now, but maybe by the time you're ready to quit. <laughs> you know, and, and we have to, the, 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 the mid-career and late-career people, uh, such as myself, have to look at the, at the younger people that are on the picket lines next to us and say, it is our responsibility to stand up for them the same way somebody stood up for us. You know, uh, personally, I, I don't think it's a good idea to stand on the wrong side of innovation. I mean, how many blacksmiths do you know? <laughs> Probably not too many. How many butter churners are you, are you friendly with? So, you know, we have to figure out a way to use uh, AI or at least accept AI that doesn't place us in the role of the blacksmith or, or the butter churner. Do you know, who's old enough to remember when they let us have calculators in math class? <laughs> I, this was larceny. I couldn't believe <laughs> I can take this in. But of course, it's a tool. They didn't want to bother us with the arithmetic because they had taught it to us and they knew that we could do it and they didn't care if we got the long division right. There was a bigger concept at work that they were trying to teach you to master. And so the mechanical act of crunching numbers was of no interest to them and they were perfectly happy to let a machine do it. But they wouldn't let you take the fancy calculator in, you know, the one that could do the cube roots and all the rest of it. That had to stay home. So let's separate the arithmetic from the cube roots. Let's separate the concepts from the, you know, stoop labor. And, and let's try to figure out a way to make peace with these machines before, of course, they take over everything and reduce us to a life of underground servitude. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know what the, what the solution is in the near term, but I, I would be interested to ask the audience a question. I have proposed to my leadership something called badging, I've called it badging, I don't know what else to call it. You know, this film was made without the assistance of machine intelligence. This television show was made without the, or if you prefer, this film was made with the assistance of machine intelligence. Whatever you want to do, I mean, you, people are used to PG and R and NC-17 or, you know, no animals were harmed in the making of this movie, so I think they would accept it conceptually as another message that they could process. But my question to all of you is, and, and, and it sounds like a loaded question, it sounds like I'm leading the witness, but I really don't mean to be. Would you care? Would you care? If the machine did something that was funny, let's say for purposes of this conversation, it was as funny as anything that you had seen a human do. If the machine did something that was moving, let's say again for these purposes, as moving as something a human would do, would you care, would it matter to you if you were entertained, delighted, touched, that the, the thing had been written by a human as opposed to a machine. Let's imagine a world in which it's no longer an LLM and these things are actually creating in a way that they're not currently creating. Would you care? Would it matter that it was done by a human versus a machine or would it not? Could I have a show of hands, the ones who would care? Would care. And I appreciate the honesty here, and, and a show of hands, the ones who wouldn't care. Yeah, so this is, you know, it's not an overwhelming majority, and I don't blame you. If you, you know, life is tough enough. If something can make you laugh, God bless. I mean, who cares where it comes from? <laughs> so, and this is a, you know, the extremely educated crowd we're talking about. This is a, these, you know, you are the, you are the cream of the cultural crop you are, who are aiming for. You, you know, so you can imagine that people who are less uh, intellectually and artistically responsible than you are, you can imagine what their responses would be. 
And, and so if we live in a world where it doesn't matter where the work comes from, where if a machine does a Rembrandt, it's still a Rembrandt, then we have to think about what creativity is, what imagination is, what evolution is, what intellectual and artistic evolution is, and whether or not it matters to us. And that's, that's the issue here. It's a pension and health issue today and tomorrow and in 15 years, but in the long run, it's a human evolution issue. And I am not smart enough to know the answer, but I'm pretty sure that's the right question. It, fantastically put. This is where technology and culture come head to head, and uh, it'll be an interesting fight to the finish. Um, uh, we'd be happy to hear from any of you in the audience uh, on any subject. It doesn't have to be related to uh, the things that we specifically discussed. So, uh, yes. Hold on. Oh, we, I think we've got a microphone coming to you. Oh, sorry. There we go. Uh, not to make a pun, but we've seen both of these movies before, right? We saw a switch uh, from, uh, from theatrical movies when, when television was invented. Now, it didn't kill uh, movies, but what it meant is that uh, instead of people going to movie theaters three times a week, which they probably did in the early 1950s, maybe they went once a week. And maybe uh, a half the movie theaters had to close because they were no, lo no longer economic. That's where we are now. If you talk to movie theater owners, who I know and, and I do talk to, they're not economic anymore. You can't keep theaters open with three Marvel films a year. It just, you just, there's just not enough seats. You can't charge enough. So maybe what happens is we see uh, two-thirds of the movie theaters close and it becomes kind of a a unique little thing, but the money is shifted from uh, motion pictures into uh, streaming, which is a different type of art form, but you know, that's where it goes. In, in terms of AI, um, we've seen this movie before too. If you go back to like 1900, there was a movement among the arts and craft uh, uh, world where basically uh, uh, they, they, they were railing against machines and you had uh, William Morris and the like who were promoting hand-drawn, uh, you know, uh, designs and the like. And what happened? So what happened is people said, yeah, 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 that's a good thing. And then people figured out how to make the hand-drawn designs with machines. And the machine art and arts and craft uh, producers took over because that's the economics of it and that's where we're heading. And you can't hold back water with your hands. It's just not going to happen. Oh, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I was just, I, I was just, I, you know, calm, 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 calm. An observation is fine. Yeah, I'm sorry. So, 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 the, so, the, so the question is, if you want to think about it, the question is, how do you hold back water with your hands? I mean, is, is that possible? Or are we just fooling ourselves talking about nostalgia here when the horse is out of the barn? Well, for example, they will call you in five years or less, and they will say, listen, we don't want the machine to write it, but we'd like you to look at what the machine would write if the machine were asked to write it, and maybe that'll give you a good starting off point. And then we'll look at it, and then we'll ask the machine what we think we should say to you about what you wrote based on what the machine <laughs> And then we'll send those to you. And then you'll take our notes and put them into the machine and ask the machine what it thinks about what our machine told us to tell your machine <laughs> it thought about what you asked it to do. And then you'll make changes and you'll send them back to us. But first you'll ask the machine what those changes should be. And then we'll take the changes and put them back into our machine. And pretty soon the machines are doing the lion's share of the work. No, you can't hold water back with your hands. To me, that stops being art very quickly. If I ask the machine even for a basic outline of something that I've been hired to write, it stops being art it, because those decisions are affected by what the machine has told me and I'm no longer pure. I'm now, at least to some degree, polluted by these suggestions that have been made electronically. and so. Uh, 
No, I can't hold back water with my hands, but I can get out of the pool, and that's what I will do. Thanks. Uh, I actually want to respond to my beloved classmate Vic's comment about whether I care or not, about whether it's 100% organic or not. Um, and the, I think the implied question you had there was, are you going to be biased in favor or against it? And I don't think I am going to be biased in favor against it, but I care a lot. I think it's really interesting what the process is that creates this art. And I think, you know, I'm a guy who will see a movie and then immediately go to the Wikipedia page and try and understand, all right, who's the director? What else has the director done? Who's the script writer? You know, what have they done? I want to know how this stuff is made and what the perspective is. And if, if I think the most interesting question of our time is, what's the perspective of that machine? What's human and what, what's not human? And that's already in our art. It's in, Gordon, it's in your work. It's in uh, the Blade Runners of the world. I'm, I'm actually in the middle of reading so as a caveat here, I'm, I'm in the middle of reading Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? So I'm kind of immersed in this topic right now. But, but I think that question of what's human and what's not human is a central question of art going forward. And I think if we don't let the machines participate in that, we're not going to be able to really fully answer that. So I want to know. I care a lot about it. But, you know, I'm, I'm on Team Human, but I also want to see what the other guys have to do. <laughs> I, I'm, that's just a comment, too. If you have responses, I'd be curious. Yeah. All the way in the back. Thanks. So I'm generally somebody who believes that, you know, technology is going to march forward and it brings down the cost for everybody. And, you know, I've seen what Amazon's done to retail. Speak up a, l speak up a little yeah. bit more. I said, um, yeah, I've seen what Amazon's done to retail. And I think there's this general idea that um, these advances in technology are good. They make things, you know, more accessible to everybody. Um, I think it's harder to see what the human consequences are of something like this. So Vic, I would be interested in you know, hearing you reflect for a moment at kind of what stage you are in your career and if this strike is, is not successful or if your worst fears come true, what does it really mean for you, you know, personally and financially and in where you are in your life right now? Well, it's, it's a great question, Bob, and, and, we, and you know, we've, we've all had to sort of look down that barrel and for me, what, I, what I've said to the rank and file, to, you know, to the broad middle class of writers like me, not stars, but, you know, make, making a living and working for a long time, is your job in the time that's left to you is to be as original as you can. Don't try to outdo what a machine has begun to be able to do. Instead, shoot from the hip, swing from the heels, be as fresh and original as you can be, make uh, your mark, and, and, and don't worry about you know, being replaced by technology because there's no way that the technology can, can have any answer for your best and most free and most expressive and most courageous work. So I do see it as an opportunity for all of us who care about this profession and want it to continue to be a profession. Uh, and I speak not just about writers, but also actors and directors and, and producers and everybody else who has an artistic hand in, in making moving image entertainment, uh, to be the, the very best artist you can without fear because the fearful response will, will get you nowhere. You know, the fearful response will drive you to obscurity for sure if they can get the same thing from a machine in 20 seconds. Um, you know, financially, we all do our best and we all uh, try to find the intersection between what the buyers will pay for and what we can stand to work on. Uh, it's not always easy, but it's easier if you're saying to yourself, okay, I don't have to follow any formulas anymore because there's no point, the machine's better at that than I, so I'm going to throw all that stuff out and do what I would do if no one told me anything about how to do it. That's my answer. And, and along those lines, I, I would say Gordon and I have talked about the, with, with these other versions of receiving entertainment, the digital versions, the smaller you know, uh, form of things, you know, is, there, is this an opportunity to invent new ways of telling stories, visually and, and through sound, and can you, 
you know, is it an, instead of replicating the movie theater thing and seeing it in miniature, is there a version where you can communicate? I don't know the answer to this, but that's for Jackson and company to figure out. But I, but you know, is there a way to um, to create in new in new ways, given the either opportunities or limitations of the format? Just real quick, in I forget exactly, late '80s, maybe '90s. Uh, Japanese and the Chinese came to us to learn creativity. They felt they had captured, they had, what would I say? They had uh, captured technology, they knew what that was, how to do it better than anyone else in the world, but they couldn't understand how to be creative. And I think to follow on Vic's point, you know, if we're gonna be competing with machines, it's about creativity. And uh, the human creativity is always going to, in my mind, be surpassing, uh, synthetic creativity simply because the human creativity, synthetic creativity seems dependent on what it's, what it's, uh, what's experiencing from human creativity, so. Um, and let's not forget that at the moment, everything the machine does is definitionally theft. I mean, it is looking at what is out there and rearranging the Lego blocks that make those things up. It, it, Yes, but I'm, but I'm not, re you, our brains are not reading everything else that's ever been written and guessing what the, the amalgamation of those creators would do on a syllable by syllable basis. So, you know, until the copyright laws catch up with what AI can do, there is no way of countering this plagiarism, but it is definitionally plagiarism. There's, there's, no, there's no objective question about that. And so, you know, we have to do new things that can't be plagiarized because they haven't been done yet. In, in driving here from, from Boston, from the airport in Boston, I was listening to a radio broadcast where there was an Irish actress who had done a lot of voiceover work and then she suddenly was listening to the radio and she heard herself, her voice that had been reassembled because she must have signed off the, uh, ownership uh, uh, properties to what she had already done for this company, and they reconfigured her voice, so she was hearing herself do something completely different that she had nothing to do with and certainly was not paid for. Um, uh, so there's that element too, and that will probably come up in the Screen Actors Guild negotiation, I imagine. It certainly should. I imagine. Yes, right there. Yeah. Human creativity. How do you define it? And Put the mic up. <laughs> it's on. Yeah. So uh, I think the fundamental issue is really what is human creativity and how uh, and what actually can AI do uh, and can it actually ever replicate it? Um, so uh, I think you have been answering quite a bit this question. But I, regarding the question you posed about uh, preference, um, it occurred to me that it might be similar to the question of uh, can you actually have a love relationship with a, with a robot, a real lo love relation? Would you accept it? It's kind of similar to that. I don't know if it makes sense, but... Uh, Are you asking me personally? I, uh... Yeah. <laughs> I, I may direct you to Annapurna Pictures' movie Her in 2016. Andreas, can you, can you tell me more about this robot? Uh, <laughs> does it come from a good robot family? Is it smart and funny and vaguely kind? <laughs> <laughs> so many hands. The gentleman in the back, yeah, they're in the gray shirt. I think it's helpful to distinguish between the world of entertainment and the world of news. And I think the question of do you care, in my mind, is I'm afraid that the boundary is uh, getting harder to tell. True that. Uh, in the second to last row on the aisle, right? Right here. No, it's, yeah, right there. Oh, gentleman in the black. This is more a question of. Is it on? Yeah. Uh, to to maybe Gordon and David, that could you give us a, a view of how the 
Spoils are being redefined across the various participants as we look at these changes. I mean, clearly Vic's comments about the, the writers, they're, they're worried about their share of the revenue. It's most likely, if you look at history, we're gonna be spending more and more of our, our resources on entertainment and services and so on, but who's gonna benefit from it uh, moving forward and what's happened with streaming versus the historical to give us some view of what might happen going forward? Yeah. The companies that, are, that are, uh, have the most to gain are these companies that are either digital companies or companies like Amazon and, and uh, Apple who have income streams from a million other places and they're, I think, less invested in culture. I well, think. one of the, que the, the key question I, I was thinking that I'd like some insight into is between the producer, the, the performer, the writer, the distributor, um, as we've seen in the history of the, the movie business, those, those share of the spoils has changed dramatically as revenue has gone up. I mean, theater revenue is down a lot from what it was when Gordon and I were just graduating 55 years ago, but the actual amount of money spent on this form of entertainment, you know, full motion video stories, whether it's a, a TikTok person or you know, a big screen, Thing, the, 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 the amount of money spent in real terms has gone up dramatically because we're not spending as, as big a percentage on, on food and other things that are, you know. But how is that shifting already? Do we see the, the days of the, the, the mega hundred million dollar stars disappearing? Is it also, you know, are they getting their contracts down a lot compared to say 20 years ago? Yeah, Bill, it, it's too early to tell. The short answer is nobody knows. You know, it's a classic line, nobody knows anything. And they haven't rationalized the economics yet. And, and Jackson was telling me, even before we got here, the streamers, the Amazons, those guys are never going to reveal the numbers that the Writers Guild is going to want to see in order to come up with some logical split of the money. And to them, those numbers are more important than streaming. Um, so you know, there's some insoluble problems. It can be solved, but the short answer is, if I was a writer or any other creative person, it's hard to get a bite of an apple that no one knows yet how to quantify. You know, the, the, there isn't just any mechanisms yet to really understand that. So it's the last 10 years. too early, it's too early. It, yeah, what it's changed is you'd, Okay, what has changed is the way money used to be split is no longer that way because you no longer have into theaters, into pay TV, into free TV, into video. You had all these logical ways that the revenue was, inc was incurred and everyone could understand how do you split it. Since that's gone, they don't know how to replace that with paying 10 bucks a month to Netflix. Yeah. Right. Also, also one thing that I noticed towards the end of my time at Annapurna is that a general trend is that upfront costs to pay talent are increasing because their back end isn't what it used to be. So there's no like true like theatrical distribution for our movies anymore. So in order to get you know a list star in our movie, we'll pay them more upfront in terms of essentially buying out their back end. Yeah, and they're also not releasing figures on their own profits. You know, the, nobody knows how well these shows are actually doing because they don't share that information. So it's better for the stars to make it up front. Um, so many people, this woman right here? Looks like yeah. Right yeah, and somebody should let us know when we're keeping the other thing. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> we'll one one, one more question after minutes. this. <laughs> Sorry. Um, this might be a question for Vic or anyone up here, if you could address this. Have you used AI? at all in your writing so far? And if you have, have there been like use cases that you've actually found it helpful and ones where it's just horrible still? I used it for every single business school final. <laughs> <laughs> your secret is safe with us. <laughs> I, uh, I haven't used it, uh, but uh, colleagues have just, just for education's sake, put the premise of their series, their television series, and a description of the main characters into uh, GPT and said, uh, please give me some story ideas for episodes, and the machine did very well. 
real quick, I just tested chat GPT and one of those things. So I said, okay, uh, deliver me a resume for being a head of Lucasfilm. <laughs> Instantaneously, it spit out a three-page perfect resume. Yeah. Wow. This gentleman <laughs> right up front who will glare at me if I don't call on him. Uh, if you speak up, I think we'll be able to hear you. other laws that are, that are uh, uh, relevant to this conversation. Um, I guess the question is, could we fashion a uh, workable accommodation for the next generation of technology? We face this issue over and over again by going to the rule of law and by modernizing the privacy regulations, the laws and regulations, the copyright laws and regulations, which have not caught up with technology and will be completely, you know, it'll be run away with unless you think forward. And there may be other, there may be, maybe the law of, maybe there's some aspect of transparency where people who are making money from your copyrighted material must disclose how much money they make. That could be put into law. It seems to me that that might be a, an area for, for you all to explore. I guess that's the question. Have you thought about this and is it, so I, I think about it every day. I mean, because it is the, those are the assets that I create and, and the right to exploit them should be mine and my partners. So you're 100% correct. There does need to be a lot of work done within that discipline and I hope it's done soon because if we, if we dawdle, we will be in serious trouble and chaos. Hank. Congress works together so wonderfully. <laughs> I am sure that we will get laws like this you know, all the so, pendulum, soon, so The soon. pendulum does swing. So all right, maybe now the that pendulum that's settled, will, will swing. Uh, I'd like to thank Jackson and Vic and Gordon and all of you for being here. Thanks very much. Thank you.